Welcome to the Wolf Connection Podcast. I'm your host, John Kalfa. Let's talk about some wolves. On this episode of the podcast, happy to have with us over Zoom, Bonnie Jill Laughlin, a, a supporter here at Wolf Connection, also the first ever female NBA scout working for the Lakers and current sportscaster up in the Bay Area near San Francisco. Bonnie Jill, pleasure to have you with us. How's everything going up there uh, in the northern part of California? It's good. I live on a horse ranch out here. So, you know, as long as you're around animals, you know, life is good. <laughs> True. Yeah, we echo that. Steven, uh, Steven actually has a, you have one horse, right? Or two? Yeah, one. Yeah, so Steven's got a horse, so he knows how what, what that, <laughs> that's all about. Um, I just, I want to get into your back. Yeah, no, it's, what's, what's the name of your horse? Nalia. So I want to get into just your background really uh, to start off so everybody gets a, an idea. You, you've done so many things. I was reading up on your bio and you're a philanthropist and you've done a lot of things um, in athletics. You're a broadcaster. So how did you get really thrown into the world of sports um, and, and have been able to, you know, to kind of navigate that to where you are now? Yeah, I started um, in sports. Uh, I mean, I knew, I guess, at a very young age, I wanted sports to be a part of my life. My dad being a season ticket holder for all the Bay Area sports teams and uh, um, always just knew that I loved sports, loved going to the games, loved, I was almost in the typical, you know, kid going to ball games. I loved like kind of finding out more about each player. My dad thought that was unique that I'm asking him, you know, mm -hmm. how fast is that, you know, that guy around the 40 and uh, what college did he go to? And that's not normal questions. A little girl asks, you know, their father when they're, you know, four or five years old. So I was kind of a little different. I, I guess you could say I was a tomboy. <laughs> and um, from then I ended up um, being a cheerleader, you know, starting with my career. I ended up being a cheerleader for the Golden State Warriors, then going on to uh, the 49ers is a cheerleader than the Dallas Cowboys. Um, got my degree at University, University of Texas in broadcast journalism and then went on to start working um, for ESPN for their morning show and um, started working also for CBS, um, KCAL. Actually, you guys know KCAL, KCBS in Los Angeles. They were actually the um, uh, covering the Lakers at the time. So I was doing pre and post game for the Lakers. And then after that, um, I was asked by the Laker organization if I wanted to start scouting. And so I scouted um, that first year. Um, it was Pac-10 at the time, obviously now Pac-12. And I scouted the first year for the Lakers. I didn't get paid. Um, I um, actually had to prove myself. And so I did that for a whole year. And then they ended up offering me a five-year um, contract and then a five-year after that and ended up being with the team for about 12 years. And uh, it was a uh, pretty memorable just to, you know, be able to pave the way for other females to know that, you know, it may be a male dominated world, but, you know, women can kind of attack anything as long as they put their mind to it, work ethic and, um, you know, be resilient. Yeah. What was that environment like when you first stepped into it? Obviously you have to prove yourself, as you just said, for a whole year. And then once you get that proven, you get the the contract or the job offer to to stay with the team for that, that many years, what is that like as sort of being a, a groundbreaker or, you know, someone who's paving the way uh, in that sort of arena in athletics? Yeah, it was tough in the beginning because being the only female, you know, there's a, a lot of men that I was scouting with that, you know, they always kind of made a joke that they've been scouting since the dinosaur ages. So they were like, wait, there's a female. Why is she here? What is she? Is she scouting cheerleaders? Like what's going on? <laughs> you know? And so they didn't really accept me at first. You know, I had to really kind of prove myself uh, to them, which is fine, you know, because it was a boys club. Um, it still is. So um, eventually I became like one of the boys, but it was, you know, a lot of um, blood, sweat, and tears, a lot of tears. There's times where I'm like, I don't want to do this. It's just, you know, there's just a lot of media scrutiny. Um, you know, as a female, you're always under a microscope when you work in sports, and it was even heightened um, just because I was the only female doing it. Um, mm -hmm. But it was worth it. Um, I like to kind of prove people along. So, um, like I said, just a lot of, uh, you know, sleepless nights, but a lot of hard work, um, making sure that I was up on every player in the, not even just, in the U.S. and the world because <laughs> we had a scout um, overseas too. And, uh, you know, just like I said, if you put your mind to it, um, you really can do anything. Yeah. I mean, what, again, what were some of the things that you went through just with that, you know, with that first year, I guess, you know, if you're, you know, you, like I said, you're breaking ground on these, these things and, and you're paving the way, you know, what, when does it, when did you realize 
that from the rest of your peers at this point that they've started to understand that you know what you're talking about. Because clearly, before we started this interview, you were talking about how you were speaking with your dad or even earlier in the interview about how you're at four years old asking these questions about these athletes that, you know, a typical four-year-old isn't asking. So when did they start to figure out Bonnie Jill is for real and she knows she knows her stuff and this is she she actually belongs here in this in this group. Yeah, I guess the minute they start talking to me because in the beginning, you know, there are stereotypes and you know, people will um, you know, they kind of look at you as okay, this is a girl that came from being a cheerleader. I also was an actress, I was a model, so she doesn't fit the typical, you know, mold of a scout, so they're thinking, okay, well, we'll just look at uh, they did kind of looked at my outer shell, if that makes sense, and my appearance, instead of getting to know me and getting to know my knowledge and my um, uh, my eye for talent and me knowing the game and how to break down the triangle offense and stuff like that, that um, kind of made them think, okay, um, you know, the old phrase, right? Don't judge a book by its cover, right? So I think they were able to get to know me. And I had some great people from the leg organization that did take me under their wing. Um, Brian Shaw, who's actually an assistant coach for the Lakers now. Um, Kurt Rambis. Um, there was a lot of Tex Winter, the late Tex Winter. So there's a lot of guys that took me under their wing and, you know, were able to kind of just say, you know, stop thinking about the fact that you're a female, do what you were hired to do. And I mean, even my first assignment was the NBA pre-draft camp. And I showed up um, walking in with the rest of the scouts and I was wearing baggy Jordan sweatsuit. My hair pulled up um, in a hat, walking like a guy, talking weird. And B-Shaw goes, what are you doing? Why are you talking and walking weird? I said, I don't know, I'm trying to fit in. He said, no, be you. He said, be who you, you know, that." Stop trying to be a dude. And I'm like, I know, but I was just, you know, you're just, I don't know, just trying to fit in. You know, I knew if my hair didn't stick out, you know, different stuff like that. And they said, you got to be genuine. You got to be you. Um, that's in anything, right? Across the board, right? Always just be true to yourself. And you know, everything else will, it may take some time, but they'll accept you. And you just got to, you know, let people know that you are knowledgeable, credible, and uh, let the rest kind of come um, with some time because it was going to take some time. And it did, um, but it was all worth it in the end. Yeah, it all it, obviously, it paid off. Obviously, you, did, you were there for over a decade, and you had, you still you still are having incredible success in the sports arena in general. Just um, I know you're you know you're you're doing sports casting up there in the Bay Area. So when you're doing all of these things, you're with the Lakers. Um, you know, wh- how did you find your way? Because I know you're very into um, horse uh, rescuing horses and, uh, canines and dogs and things of that sort. And, and as well as helping, uh, military and veterans. So we'll get into that in a little bit. How did you find your way then to Wolf Connection that you were able to, uh, come here initially and then be a sponsor and be part of the organization for, for a while? Yeah, there was a friend of mine who had already been up to Wolf Connection and she said, hey, I want you to come out here. I think you'll really um, love what they're doing. Um, not only are they helping um, and rescuing wolves, they actually have this um, great you know, programs they do um, with inner city kids, with youth, with um, women, everything. Um, you should come out and check them out. And so I went and immediately, um, I mean, right when you walk on to you know, that plan. I went to actually the old Wolf Connection before the new place. And, but it doesn't matter. The minute you walk onto that property, there's just like some kind of like, I don't know, it's kind of magical. And you feel like this release of like, gosh, it's serenity, you know, and you go on there and right away, you know, I was able to go through um, with, I believe it was Teo, it was Teo who took me for the first tour and be able to just see these wolves. I mean, I've been around wolves, but not in this kind of um, capacity and just this connection that you get with these animals. Um, you know, me being an animal activist and advocate, I, mean, I love all animals, but there's something very magical and spiritual with um, wolves. They, you can connect with them. They look into your soul. They don't just stare at you. There's something just very, there's this like wolf connection. There's a connection that you get, this bond. And I met actually um, one of the wolves, uh, Bo, uh, immediately had a connection with him. And, you know, wolves are, uh, I love the way that they're not like, you know, obviously we all love dogs, but dogs right away, they don't care. You know, they jump right on you. They, you know, lick in your face, wagging your tail, right? But with wolves, they check you out. They want to see what you're all about. They're curious. They want to know if, you know, they can tell if you're a good or a bad person. They have to figure out. They're not going to 
trust you right away. And that's something to be said. And I'm a lot like that. So I kind of felt that connection of just, um, just how these wolves, how, you know, Bo kind of, you know, was trying to figure out like, you know, smelling me, looking at me, and then eventually having this like connection, this bond that I got, you know, immediately with him. But, um, there's a lot you can learn from wolves. Um, you know, as you guys know, obviously firsthand. So after I'd had that first, you know, experience with him, I ended up coming back. I want to say, gosh, maybe two to three months later, not a long time, but enough time had passed. And I went back into his enclosure and he immediately, you guys ran over to me. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, he ran over to me and he started kissing my face and tail was like, he remembers you. And I go, do you think he does? And he goes, absolutely. He remembers you. So, you know, there was that, you know, connection. And then there were times where, you know, one time, like eight months went by, he would still like, you know, come right. He always knew me. And it was like, he almost reminded me, you guys of like, he was kind of like a wise old man. You know what I mean? Like he was so, he was, um, he had this very majestic, uh, type of way about him and regal and, um, uh, wise, like I said, and um, there's just something that he just spoke to my soul. And I just, you know, right away, I was like, well, I got to sponsor, I got to sponsor him. Um, and I did that. And year after year, I almost did it for four years until he passed. And there was just something about him. And every time, like I would even, you know, I, I was able to, luckily enough, um, Rudy had called me and Renee and said, hey, he's not, uh, he's not looking good. You should come out and see him. And so I saw him probably about five days before he had passed. And even though he was still, you know, you know, at that time he didn't, he seemed pretty good still, but he, you know, slowly came over and laid with me for about 45 minutes. And he just, it was just pretty magical. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we've, that, Bo, Bo was a tough one for, for a lot of us. I mean, Stephen, yeah. you know, Stephen hit on the head and, and I love it what you said about him. And he really was, like an old, like a sage or an old wise He's Gandalf being, yeah, the, like a Gandalf, absolutely. <laughs> and I, I, I think I don't I you think not. you guys? I mean, it's just it's something about him. It's like a wise old man. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. he was the sage. He, he was yes. around for such a long time. Yeah, he was such a sage. And I, I was telling you, Bonnie Jill, before we we started, like he, he was one of the first animals I walked. And so when they, when yeah, you know, when too. you start here, and they're like, yeah. okay, we're gonna give you Bo to walk, and Bo was. Big. I mean, he's a he's a big animal. He was almost you know ninety pounds, and he kind of mm-hmm. came up to your waist. But he was just there. Were, like you said, there was something so gentle and welcoming and kind about him, in the way that you could sort of make him a little bit of a mistake, and it was okay. And he yeah, he, he was would, forgiving. He, he was very that. forgiving yeah. about that. I mean, what did you feel? A lot of that that same. You, you spoke so beautifully about him. Was there anything? you know, just about him in general that, that you said, man, over the course of time, over the four years that you were sponsoring him, that you just started to, to feel um, with him as, as you were connecting on a deeper level. Yeah. And sorry, I got choked up, but it was just so, cause he was so beautiful. He was just kind of a perfect, you know, animal. So it was, it was tough. Then we had reached out to me. Let me know that um, he had to be, um, he would put down, but it was, it was just sad. It was just, you know, cause he just, um, I know he was never five, you guys correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think he was ever an alpha, but he just still had that kind of alpha mentality. Yeah. He was never, he was never an alpha. He was really, he was such a good, or at least uh, like a balanced omega. I don't, at least we didn't observe the, the, the behavior usual that, behavior yeah. that would cause, co- not the usual behavior for him necessarily, but the usual behavior from, uh, from the others that would s- signify yeah. that he was a, that he was an alpha, but yeah, it's, but it's interesting that you say that though too, right? Because you have sort of that, he had that grounded personality and it wasn't yeah. overbearing and it was like we were saying, welcoming and, and kind and just very accepting of yeah. multiple, you know, not just adults, but kids. I mean, there were a lot of kids and, and youth that used to come here that connected with Bo and his story of, you know, a little bit of, you know, mistreatment. And but he sort of paved the way to allow others to be in his life, even after the, all those, all, you know, the incidents that happened with him, which I think is such a beautiful thing for him to teach a lot of us. Um, yeah, he was forgiven. A lot of animals are like that, you know, these wolves too. When you go there, you see, you know, you go through all the enclosures and see all the different stories of from fur farms to abuse to, you know, these different stories. And they're still so um, willing to want to connect with humans where, you know, a lot of, you know, 
humans are like, all right, I'm done, <laughs> right? Checked out. Out, but they still have that way of being able to forgive and to move forward, um, and uh, that's something we can learn a lot from uh, from them. Yeah. What were some of the things that you took from your your initial visits? Because you said there you, you related a, a little bit to how the wolves sort of gauge individuals, whether it be human or other wolves, before they really welcome them into their pack or to kind of not I don't want to say accept, but really just sort of be able to be around them in a way that's comfortable. So how did you, how, what were some of the things that you initially felt when you first, you know, came here for those first few visits before, you know, you, you sponsored Bo and you were really in it? I think it was so much uh, learning from Teo, you know, because, you know, learning that they, the wolves are like, what, 300,000 years old and how they kind of evolved. And you start to picture like, you know, we all have dogs, right? So you start to see the things that your dog does <laughs> that wolves do, you know? And um, so there's a, a connection of like, okay, this is kind of like my dog, yet, yet, you know, just a different type of um, species that's, you know, just above that, that has that uh, high intellect that, um, like I said, I always say spiritual because they've got that, there's something magical and spiritual about these wolves, you know, and going, the connection of the Native Americans and my dad, uh, my mother um, is a quarter Apache Indian. And so there's, you know, I kind of did some reading about that connection and that, um, what is, what is that called? Is that the wheel that you guys have there at the, um, yeah, the medicine wheel, the medicine wheel. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. And that, um, just all that when you're there and then, um, you know, when I've done some of the hikes with you guys at night, there's just, I can't explain until people go there. There's something that it's like, you just feel different. You leave that property and you leave Wolf Connection feeling better about life, feeling better about your purpose or maybe making sure you have a purpose. Um, it's it's kind of hard to explain, but you guys, am I kind of making sense? There's something about it that you just, you want to like, I don't know, strive to be better. <laughs> yeah, I, it's it, it's different for everybody. It's It's interesting because we, what's great about the space literally of, of, of where we are with 165 acres is we give everybody the opportunity to feel however they feel. I, I mean, it sounds simple, but it's just to give people the space to speak, to, fee, to feel, to be who they really are or what they really want to be. Like you said, maybe there's something they've been, that's been down deep inside that they, you know, want to tap into that they you know, for their entire lives, I've been pushed down or, or maybe I haven't reached, the, you know, the goal that I want to. And this is, the, this is the kick that I need to do that. So it's just beautiful to allow that to happen and to allow that space to really let everyone find it in their own way, which is, I think, one of the, one of the magical, if you want to say that, and beautiful things about it. Yeah, it's very therapeutic, you know, from like from all different walks of life because we all deal with issues and different things and stressors or depression or, you know, triggers or whatever, but there's something calming about the wolf and there's something that makes you uh, just settle into who you are and um, and just, uh, I don't know, other things, it seems like the different, not to say the issues, you know, when you leave don't still happen, but there's something different the way that maybe you'll handle things. There's a very calming, um, like you decompress. I guess it's the best way for me personally. What did you take away? What were some of the things that you took away from any time that, any time that you visited, whether it was the old property, the new property, when you maybe had a visit with Bo, what were some of the things that you took away from any of your visits here? I think it's, um, you know, not to reiterate, but I think it was something, you know, for me being, um, you know, in the entertainment world and sports world, you're, there's a lot of um, stress and um, pressures that you're um, under and perfection, if that makes sense. And different things that when you are there with the wolves and a wolf connection and speaking with Renee and tail, it's to be comfortable um, that we all, uh, we can't be perfect and it's fine. And that you can be with these wolves and they, they're going to love you and accept you unconditionally, whether you feel you don't look your best or you gained weight or like whatever it is, there's something where these, these wolves, these animals, they're like, we don't care about that. <laughs> do you have a good soul and do you have a good spirit and, and that inner kind of beauty is, uh, they bring that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's almost on a deeper level, which is, which is what we try to get to here. It's not, it's not surface. Yeah. That's, that's the best part. Um, yeah. I just, I'm so glad that we, we spoke about Bo too, because he just, he's always there in the back of my mind. And I'm just, I'm so touched that he, 
that he was such an influence for you and and we're we're grateful that you were a sponsor for him and and that he, you know he brought you know he brought you to us which was which is great and we always love that th- those stories mm-hmm. and to have you know those connections happen and and for that to work out the way it did yeah he kept me coming back <laughs> he kept, we kept me coming back always i mean and uh i have two big i have a big poster blown up of him in my house um mm-hmm in LA that, uh, I see him every, you know, whenever I'm there and then I have a smaller one here in Northern California, but, uh, he just, uh, he, like I said, he looked into your soul, but until you, until you go there, it's hard to explain, right? People just, they need to get to Wolf Connection because it's, it's, I think it's Mm life-changing. No. And we appreciate the, we appreciate that. I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're doing what we can right now, obviously with everything that's happening with, with COVID and, you know, we're, we're making do with what we can, what we can do, but yeah, it's, it's, we've, we've noticed that when people come here, it's, it's needed. Um, and it's, it's beautiful. And I'm glad you, you still have those memories. And we, we, I can't wait to have you back at, at some point, whenever you're back in LA for you to come back and, and see everybody and see the wolves. And yeah, I was saying, I can't wait to get back. Cause now I gotta, you know, make sure that I can, uh, see who I can, uh, <laughs> sponsor next. No, we can't wait for that. I, um, I do want to talk about um, some of the other stuff that you, that you do, some of the other philanthropy work, your, your family is a huge military influence. Uh, your, your two grandfathers were in World War II. Your uncle is a lifelong Marine. Your, um, who was it? Your father was an undercover narcotics officer. I believe he's retired, right? Is that correct? I think he's, he, he was 33 years, I think. Yeah, I was you did good yeah. research. Yeah. Hey, that's, <laughs> you know. <laughs> no, and I, you know, please, um, you know, from from one uh, military family, my my father, my brother, and so uh, thank thank them for, uh, thank thank your uncle. I, I, I'm not aware if your grandfathers are still w- with you, um, but if if they are, you know, no, they passed. But thank you. Passed. But thank you, thank them for our service, uh, and your father as well. Uh, obviously, that's these are all points of service uh, for us to be doing the things that we do. So you, you've you started, you've traveled around the globe, as you were saying, not just with the NBA, but you do stuff with the USO tours to help the troops. And, and you've coincided that with a lot of campaigns for uh, farm sanctuaries, uh, Sea Shepherd, PETA, um, et cetera. So how did those two things come together for you? Obviously your family had an influence, I would imagine, but then, and your love for animals. So how did you you know, really get into those two, two avenues and, and connect them together? I think it was, you know, just exactly what you said. I think it was combining my two passions, which is um, supporting our men and women in uniform um, and also being able to um, combine my love for animals and being an animal advocate and animal welfare. And so I wanted to be able to, you know, rescue these, you know, these dogs who, normally would be euthanized, usually the high risk dogs, um, and train them and then provide um, service and therapy dogs for wounded warriors, combat veterans, veterans, um, and be able to connect them. You know, as you guys know, connection is huge. um, And being able to have these, uh, you know, animals, um, these dogs be able to change these men and women's lives from these, you know, from amputees being able to, you know, provide a service dog or a therapy dog for, you know, as we know, the suicide rate is so high for veterans to be able to help them through PTS, through TBI, um, through their depression, um, and be able to just see a complete change um, when we do these um, partnering up because it's crazy. I mean, you guys, there's, we've had, you know, a Marine who wouldn't even leave his house. He would sleep in his closet. He was always felt like he heard bombs going off and, you know, didn't have a relationship with his wife at the time or his kids. And we paired him up with this amazing rescue German shepherd um, who had been abused as well. Um, They bonded and he ended up getting his life back. He had a purpose. He had a reason to get up each day. And now he's back with his wife, his kids. Um, He has a job. He goes grocery shopping, which I know sounds like a simple task, but to him it wasn't. And he's, you know, it's completely life-changing. So as you guys know, when you can completely heal and help another human, it's um, pretty rewarding. Rewarding, uh, to be able to do that. And we also do that equine therapy. We do wounded warrior retreats um, for um, wounded warriors to come out and ride rescued um, horses, horse I've rescued from slaughter. And the same thing, um, just being able to help um, get that bond and to, you know, change someone's life. Yeah. Nalia was actually rescued from slaughter as well. And I find that she has so many 
uh, personality traits in common with wolves for some reason. I don't know. Wh- I don't know why a predator and a and a prey animal would have so much in common, but I just feel like they do. It's very. It's a very weird phenomenon that I find in horses and wolves. I'm like, they seem so familiar. They seem you know familiar to me. They're both very. I don't know. It's it's. I'm trying to pinpoint what that is. Actually, I've been trying to pinpoint it <laughs> every time I'm with her. I'm like, what is it about you that reminds me of like, what is it about you that reminds me of Willow for some reason? Yeah. You know, like it shouldn't, but it does. <laughs> I guess, I guess, I guess they're, I guess they're two, they're two species that have been very stubborn in the best way about letting go of their wildness. Uh, I guess they that it's it's pretty rare. They have animals that are just so intact and, you know, so still so from, so similar to their wild ancestors. Uh, and they're two animals that I find are beautifully keeping that intact, no matter what people are doing to them. I think that's what you nailed it on right there on the head is that, that they're both, uh, they go, we think of horses and wolves. They've been yeah. around forever, right? I mean, there's something to be said just with that, right? Mm-hmm. And when you think of a wolf or a horse, you kind of think of that, you know, you think of, uh, all the years and thousands of years that this, this, you know, world even been around or, you know, when you think of a horse, you kind of think of America, the horses, they were roaming roaming free, you know, before we were even around. So there's something there, I think about that, that makes them kind of majestic. Yeah. And it's interesting that they both have some of the most complex scenarios, uh, conservation related scenarios around the, around both species. Like they're both, they both have these concepts around them related to conservation that seem impossible to solve. I think that's funny that these two, these two species that are so connected to their wildness are causing all of this, you know, it's just a lot of tension around the, around the subject. Yeah, absolutely. Because I've been working on the SAFE Act, you know, since 2010, I've been going to Capitol Hill to try to get the SAFE Act passed, which is against um, banning horse slaughter. And it's amazing how that's even an issue, right? <laughs> or oh, yeah. having to protect wolves. Like I, it's sometimes uh, really uh, disheartening to go up on the hill and see that some politicians um, just don't care about you know, these animals and it's, you know, I mean, that's a whole nother podcast, right? But, yeah. you know, it just, it's, it's, uh, it's depressing and it's, um, it's really sad. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's something, yeah, we can, we can have you back on and, and go into all that. I, I do, I know you're, you're short for time, so I don't want to, I, I don't want to go over our time that we were talking about. So I, I, I have one more question then I do want to uh, push your social medias and uh, your, uh, your hounds, hounds for heroes, I believe is your nonprofit, correct? Yeah, hounds and heroes. Hounds and heroes. Okay, but yeah. So my my last question that I have for you, and you you've said so many beautiful things already, but when you hear the word wolf, what's something that comes to your mind? Gosh, there's so many things. I mean, from being, um, like I said, majestic, spiritual, uh, compassionate, um, the way that they are with their family, like their pack, um, they're empathetic. The way they raise their young is just like how every mother or woman raises their children. The, um, mm. It's just uh, the connection with humans are so much like us. Um, like I said, we can learn so much because they are very trusting considering everything they have been through and how humans have treated them over, you know, decades, uh, you know, of our existence. Um, so I think it's just, um, like I said, learning from them about, you um, being more compassionate, empathetic, um, being more connected to um, these animals, to the earth, to, you know, all those different things um, that some people aren't, they have no connection. You know, they, um, what is it that saying? Um, if you haven't uh, been, a, had an animal or been around an animal, a part of your soul um, isn't awakened or something like, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? There's that. Yeah. And it's yeah. true until you have been around, you know, you know, animals. I think there's certain people who haven't been around animals. So they are kind of missing that in their life. There's something that they, that can, that can change you. You know, I mean, I think that if you don't have animals around you, I think, I don't think I'd be a very good person. I'll be honest with you. You know, there's something about that being the person that your dog thinks you are. I mean, I know I'm going into all these little things, but it's all true. You know? No. Yeah. I think, I think that is true. Animals are therapeutic. They make you better. They make you a better person. You can be in the worst mood and you get around, you know, go up to Wolf Connection and all of a sudden, all that's out the window. Every Life is good, you know? It's uh, it's interesting how therapeutic and how they can really set your mind right. Yeah, they're like a, a quantum leap to your uh, true nature or something. 
And similarly to like meditation or, you know. Right. Absolutely. Right. No, I agree with you. And it's, yeah, we. I feel it every time I come on the property, right? It's just like- Yeah, you just get sucked into to yeah. something. I don't know. Yeah. You just feel a whole different you vibe. You drive in. You feel different. Yeah. And everything gets lit. There's a bad, you know, that everything on your shoulders that you've been weighing on you kind of just goes away. Yeah. It's a good feeling to have. It's a great feeling. Um, so Bonnie Jill, where can, so where can people follow you? I know like where, if you don't mind giving them your Instagram, I know you post a lot of great stuff. Um, and also give us the, the website for Hounds and Heroes as well. So people can go and check that out as well. Yes. So they can find us on all the you know, social medias, Hounds and Heroes and houndsandheroes.com. And then on social media um, at Bonnie Jill. And I'm always posting something that I always tell people, if you don't like animals um, or um, our military or sports, you probably don't want to follow me, but <laughs> cause that's all I talk about. <laughs> that's kind of me in a nutshell. Right. Um, but yeah, I think Holden is my next, um, kind of, I'm looking for thinking I'm going to sponsor Holden. I, I love him. He just like, oh, I know, something yeah. real loving about, he's like a big boy, like kind of clumsy, uh, funny. Um, I don't know. He just reminds me of, a, um, I don't know. He just makes me laugh whenever I'm around him. Totally different than Bo. Right. Yeah. Um, but Sounds like, uh, Holden. Yeah. he's, Something about him. He's funny. He's like a big kid or something. I don't know. He is. Yeah. yeah he's a, he he's, definitely is. He's a, he's a loving, he's a loving guy. So that's, that'd be great. We were uh, hanging out with him this morning. Yeah, we were. Good he's guy. <laughs> he's a good guy. He's uh, precious. He's just got, he's just got like a big bear or something. He's something about him. Is so, he's so different than the other ones. <laughs> he's just kind of goofy to me. I love it. Bonnie Jill, thank you for giving us uh, as much time as you have. I know you, you're actually running off to yeah, a race, right? A I think over. right after this. So um, I know you have to get your, your, your yeah, horse ready to go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, But I, listen, I, I can't thank you enough. I, I'd love to have you back on again. Keep us updated with Hounds and Heroes the next time you want to come out to, to the property because mm-hmm. we, would, we would love to have you back. And uh, you know, I'm sure the Wolves would love to see you. And uh, just keep doing what you're doing. And it's, uh, we, I can't thank you enough for the support uh, that you've given us. Yeah, thank you. And, and the Wolves here. We'll keep supporting and we're even talking to Tail about doing, once we get back to normalcy, getting some more fundraisers going and get you guys um, some much needed money and to get more people to sponsor these wolves. And uh, like I said, it's life changing. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much, Bonnie Jill. Howls to all of you out there. And we will talk to you all next time. Bye, everybody. Bye.